The following program is a presentation of N.E.T. What can you do to amuse me Now that there's nothing to do The TV set's busted and can't get a picture Radio plays nothing but news So come on and tickle me Oh gee, won't that be fine What a great idea perfect way to lose some time you can't stop to think cause if I do I know I'll lose my mind so come on and tickle me People have a wonderful feeling inside them because a rainbow has a lot of colors. The American Dream by Kirsten. Magic. Witchcraft. Making things happen. Feeling very needed. Having fun. The American Dream by Laura. Country, very beautiful, moving a lot. Woods are very clean, clean. American Dream by Daniel. Army, brother, machine gunning hard. Hope it never comes war. The American Dream by Jamie. Basketball, big basket, running for ball. The Knicks are great, fast. The American Dream by Lionel Hampton. Children, kid power, take over grown-ups. My own hot rod, president. The American Dream by Maria Dillon. Helping, helping people, being wanted a lot, caring for someone special, caring. G.I. Joe, U.S. Army, reporting for duty. Let's take a look at the toys children use when they act out their fantasies. Children are society's little people, and their imaginations, like their toys, reflect the society they live in. Toy manufacturers employ teams of psychologists who design today's toys as models for kids to imitate. So what little boy, if he's any kind of boy at all, 
would turn down a trip to the Arctic to fight for survival against nature's rawest elements. And the little girl, the spitting image of her mom, what does she dream of? Her own home? Her kitchen full of electrical appliances? Her vacuum cleaner? Her own set of rags? And the boy, does he dream of being sent on a secret mission to Spy Island? Or undergoing the dangers of the depths and killing a marauding shark with his spear gun? Wouldn't that little woman of four or five, whoops, go into raptures over her own shopping cart and miniature grocery shelf, chock full of tiny brand name items? Childhood is preparation for the adult world. A child's toy conditions the child to society's customs and values. Childhood is short and the young will soon be old. So when the little man dreams of going on a safari to equatorial Africa with his G.I. Joe kit, he is actually preparing himself for entry into the adult business world. And the little miss, isn't she in training for her later life role when she and busy Becky, the frenetic housekeeper here, ha, scrub, iron, dust, and vacuum? Kids learn all the time. They acquire information at school, on the street, from the TV, and from each other. Oh, I had such a busy day today, mopping, vacuuming, ironing. I hope shopping Cheryl comes home with the food soon so I can make dinner for G.I. Joe. I have to housekeep and cook for my man. It makes him happy. Hark, that must be Cheryl with the food. In comes Cheryl with the food. She walks in. Whew, the market was so crowded and every woman in Toyland was ahead of me, and there weren't any specials. Well, I'm glad you got here, Cheryl. The man of the house will be home soon. Oh, what's Joe been up to? I'll show you. It's in the book here. He killed a shark in danger of the depths, wiped out a tiger in the white tiger hunt, and he captured the pygmy gorilla. He sure leads an interesting life. Well, when we were kids and playing with dolls, Joe was always having adventures. I guess he just grew up this way. Here he is. G.I. Joe, U.S. Army, reporting for duty. No, Joe. You're not in the military now, and there's no market for war toys. Go put your gear away. Is he always like that? I don't know what I'm going to do. He's got his feet in the air doesn't want to work or stay home and look after the house. He's just so unrealistic. All units, commence firing. What are you going to do? Doesn't matter. He'll be off on another adventure soon.
When my children were very small, and there was a baby inside and three or four scuttling around. In the evenings when I was tired and sitting in a chair resting, it'd gather around and say to me, Mother, please tell us, tell us. Tell us that thing you tell us every day. And perhaps there would be one resting his head, listening to the new one inside. And I'd say to them, when you were born, that left two separate human beings. There is nothing I will not do to help you to become what I think you want to be. But you do not belong to me. You belong to you. And you take good care of yourself, for you are all you will ever own. a girl who always liked to look around and would look everywhere. She had to look down at people and up at people. She was too old not to do any chores and she was too old to go to the little school, too young to go to the big school. Vroom, vroom, vroom. She was too young to drive a car. Wah! She was too old to cry and too young to go to a psychiatrist. One day another girl came along. The girl said hi. And they were just the right age to be friends. The end. What kind of life would you like to see for your kids? There's no reason why that if I, as a black man, and I'm not going into, I'm not no militant, and I'm not disassociating myself, I'm going to unite with any person or any group who's going to help me get out of this bind. The only thing that I'm saying, I'm a hardworking man. I've been that way for ever since I was a kid. What I'd like to see is that we, when we sit around in a group like this, I would like to be able to point out for you to point out to me, have you been involved in the struggle for my, for my rights? When I can send my son to Vietnam, when I can come home and see my wife and kids in security, uh, that's what I want. Now, I think in the last program, I ain't take for nothing from her, but she wants to go into well, business. Well, I'm asking, and, and yeah, you, but you, you look for sort of security for your I want kids. security. I want my rights. If 
if I decide to move here, if I decide to send my son over there, uh, uh, education, uh, I want these things and I want my government to help guarantee me that. And I'll do everything that I physically can and financially can. I've done that. And that's all I want. Then you, what do you, what do you look for? You got the six kids. I know your girl's married. When, what, 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 what do you hope for or look for? I don't know. After Leon, I always sound so flighty and so, I don't know. I, he always puts it down. You know, he comes on heavy. And I always sound like such a nincompoop, a flighty type of person. But, I, I mean, it's not that I'm not looking for security. Listen, I am. I'm, I want a little security. But like I said once before, that's not the big thing in my life. And I hope to God that it's not going to be the big thing in my children's life either. You said, what do I want? What would I like for the kids? I don't know if the kids would like what I'd like for them, but... I'd like for the rest of their life to have movement and excitement and intrigue and uh, uh, happenings and events and uh, blood moving and working, everything, you know, living. <laughs> I don't know. I, George, I think I'm in your boat. I'm not, I'm not being understood. <laughs> That's quite a boat, isn't hey, it? Hey, Mike, Mike. Well, anyway, I, I could never, never explain uh, orphan homes to anybody. But the first 17 years of my life were in them, and uh, I don't want my kids to live the way I had to. Mike, we didn't know. Well, that. when my kids grow up, uh, I expect them to be uh, no, Mike, wait, wait. be were rebels. Raised, you were raised in an orphan. I'll you cherish that. Yes. Now you, Even well, if they rebel against me, well, because, I, I mean, I'll yeah. cherish that rebellion because it means they're alive. I never had a chance Mike, to Mike, go back a minute. I, 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 I didn't realize it. You know, Every time Mike, I open my mouth, wait, wait, Mike, <clears> hey, Mike, wait, 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 we'll start again. I, I, you, you, you were raised in an orphan home. Yeah, I couldn't explain it, so I'm not even going to bother. But go ahead. I, didn't I interrupt. couldn't. I, no, I couldn't explain the orphan home. No, so but go ahead. Go ahead from there. I'm sorry. No, I just say when my kids, as they grow up, you know, if you, a lot of people think they expect their children to think for themselves and uh, one of the dangers of that is your kid is going to think different than you <laughs> you know like uh, I expect uh, as my kid grows up to constantly uh, challenge uh, my beliefs you know tradition whatever they are but I intend to be there always to be that uh, sounding board I intend always to have that reaction you know like I don't believe in a Dr. Spock thing I definitely spank my kids but I kiss them and hug them too you know they know I'm there all the time like, remember the statue that uh, Laura broke? You know, she broke that thing. Let me explain one other <laughs> thing. When I first met Mike, came to his house, there was a Madonna on the floor, and the head was severed from the body. And he says, my little kid Laura, Dr. Spocked it, is the way she put it, <laughs> meaning that he was permissive. Well, I think you misunderstand the guy, but nonetheless, know, it's a very yeah. funny crack. That's when I first met Mike, you know. Yeah, you know, she busted the statue. Yeah. Now, I think uh, if I'd have just thrown that statue away, or put it together without her seeing me do it, and bought another statue, she would have never got the idea of what she did. But I spanked her for what she did. But then I put the statue together in front of her so she could see that things were made, that you do things with your hands, you know what I mean? A lot of people, I think children, sometimes live in a world where they think things are created, you know what I mean? All of a sudden, they are there. My daughter doesn't... I don't think that she believes that way now because she... Whenever, whenever uh, she asks questions about anything, I always try to explain fully to her just what it is, you know. Like uh, on the TV, you know, and I give her the names of all the shows. Or uh, I, We've got her now. She's three years old. She uh, dials the TV. She turns different stations and everything. In other words, she's very much involved in, uh, let's say, what she wants to see. If she wants to see Sesame Street, she watches it. I don't sit her down in front of the TV and say, this is Sesame Street, and you watch it. If she doesn't want to watch Sesame Street, then maybe she watches something else. But I, I also, you know, got my own shows, and I argue with my, my daughter's three, three years old, I argue with her about the TV, you know, <laughs> whether they're going to see her show or mine, you know. But that, I never had that when I was a kid. When I was a kid, it was, I was raised like a zombie, really. When you were a kid, you were what? Raised like a zombie, you know. Were you smacked? Wow. <laughs> Pass it on to Jim. There was once a boy who walked on his hands. 
This caused him to see things differently from other people. He was able to see under things, things that were close to the earth, small things, intimately. But being different from other children, he knew that there was more than one way to look at things. He didn't mind at all being different. His life was one adventure after the other. He had a wonderful time examining things, finding out how they were made and how they worked. And though many people who crossed his path were harassed and frowning, from his point of view, they appeared to be smiling and this made him very happy. But he made people uncomfortable. They thought it was somehow wrong that the boy should not see things their way, the right way. They decided that he should be straightened out. They held a town meeting to determine what could be done. They called in experts. The doctor said, a rare case of deficiency of hypertension and heart palpitation. Lungs peculiarly unclouded, digestive system, non-acid. It's obvious this young man is deprived of the manifold tastes, colors, shapes, and effects of the assorted patent medicines available and so widely enjoyed by our population. The psychiatrist said, a strange instance of psychic equilibrium or well-being, highly unrealistic to say the least. An absence of Oedipal manifestations and paranoid behavior. Obviously, his hate instincts have been suppressed. The sociologist said, a sad lack of competitive drive, incidence of concern for others, naive trust in human nature, an inconceivable passivity toward the war. His teacher said, he's always been unusual. He has to paint grass pink and water purple. He refuses to call a fact a fact. Oh, he's not a bad boy, but with all his questions, why this, why that, who knows how he wind up. His parents said, we just don't know how this happened to us. What sort of profession will he ever have? Isn't there some way to overcome this dreadful condition? So the boy was put under therapeutic treatment. He was given injections, simultaneous hot baths and cold showers, spun centrifugally clockwise, then counterclockwise, put in traction, lobotomy, frontal and backward, given brainwashing three times a day, saturated with TV commercials and red and blue radiation. The treatment went on for a prolonged period. Finally, the boy stood up for the first time on his feet. What he saw frightened him because he found that the opposite view of love was hate, beauty was ugliness, individuality was conformity, plenty was poverty, understanding was prejudice, cooperation was competition, depth was superficiality, concern was indifference, Truth was lies, joy was despair, and peace was war. He went into a spin and landed on his hands. This is impossible, said the townspeople. We're back where we started from. He must be made to see right from wrong. But the boy in spite of all the back-to-health conditioning, was adamant. He said, if you want me to stand on my feet, 
you will have to make some big changes first. in New York City. It's a rough place to live for a kid because you can't do everything that you really want to, the things that the adults can do. Take the movies, for instance. I'm a movie buff, but I can't see every film that I really want to. In New York, most theaters just couldn't be bothered with kids. They don't want them in the theater alone. They say that we just couldn't be bothered and that we can't take care of them. And the theaters that do let us in, they make us sit in a section far away from all the adults and everybody else, just where there's kids. And then the matron comes in and yells at you and tells you where to sit and not to do this and what to do and do this and do that. And they make you feel very uncomfortable and unwelcome and second class and very small. And the movie problem everywhere are the movie ratings. They say what films to see and what not to see. The G rating is for everybody. And the GP rating, that's for everybody too, but parents should know what, f what the film is about. Then comes the R rating. Persons under 17 not admitted unless accompanied by a parent. And then the X. Persons under 17 not admitted, period. Now these X ratings mostly are given to films with all about sex. Now my question, is sex such a terrible thing that we shouldn't see it? What is sex? Is it lust or passion? No, I think it's love. I think sex is love, and here they are putting down one of the greatest things the two people can ever accomplish in the world, just because of our age. Putting down a great thing when there are so many other things in the world that we should be barred from, they pick this beautiful thing, love. Uh, I dreamt uh, like uh, 
getting out of the ghetto. Not getting out of the ghetto to flee from my, from, from my own culture, or from my own people. But to get out of the ghetto because the rats and the roaches was a drag. You know? The anxiety of the ghetto is a drag. So I had a dream to get out of that. Because when I got out of the ghetto, I was able to travel. I was able to go places, see things, be among people. The entire company is in the, is in the state of Durango, uh, in the city of Durango, located in Mexico. The Mexican technicians are, are really incredible. They're fantastic, highly committed, and uh, they have never shot a Western quite like this before. Uh, and I don't think anywhere uh, a Western, as Sidney and I are doing, uh, has ever been done before. Uh, it's more than just adventure, although there's a great deal of that in the film. It deals with an important part of black history. For some miraculous, mysterious reason, I was able to overcome and it wasn't all my own doing. It was a, a series of chain reactions. Certain things happened. And uh, uh, here I am. The characters, uh, Buck and the Preacher, uh, really have some, although they're fictional, they have some roots in history and in reality. It's, it's, uh, it's the opportunity and the incredible privilege of uh, working not only with Sydney as my co-star and Ruby D, but to also having Sydney uh, as my director. Uh, he brings a certain consciousness to the material because he is black. He brings a certain consciousness to the material because he's had vast experience uh, after making over 30 films throughout the years. And for the first time working under a black director, I find that as an artist, I am much more susceptible, I'm much more open. Uh, I am much more in tune to the kind of character that I play because uh, it deals with, with blackness. It deals with uh, black psyche. It deals with black lore. It deals with black language. Gotcha. Uh, mama, mama. Blessings in his name. I am the Reverend Willis Oaks Rutherford of the High and Low Order of the Holiness Persuasion Church. Where are you from, Reverend? Sunflower County, Mississippi, mostly. What about your head? In the vastness of God's green earth, there's no corner that does not challenge my ministry. I'm here today, and I'm going to do it again. <laughs> go. go ahead, do it. Just a line. Okay, pick up. Third, please. You want to go from the top? No, okay, uh, from the top. Tom, bring okay. that. Oh. Action! Come ahead, Harry. Cut it. Cut it, please. Hot door, hot door. I don't remember what all of my exact thoughts were as a, as a young person as a young man, as a child. Uh, as a young man, I do, but as a child. Uh, I'd have to say that uh, too many things didn't make sense to me. And uh, my real hope and my real thrust in life was to try to, uh, to ferret out information, to try to ferret out truth. You need a special kind of love to survive. Uh, I learned love in the ghetto. Not just pain, not just hate, not just anguish. I learned love. I learned the importance of survival. Uh, nothing was waste. Uh, everything came too hard, and therefore it was very dear to us. So that uh, uh, there were many positive things. When I started out as an actor, I chose to be an actor at a time when there were no black actors with any degree of dignity involved in the film business. You understand what I'm saying? Now, had I assessed uh, the situation at that time, I would have, from a practical point of view, said it's ridiculous to go into the motion picture acting business because, first of all, you're going to get all kinds of scratch-your-head parts, if you get any at all. And, uh, but I did, not, uh, I, I did not conclude 
that that would be my fate. I decided that I could be as good an actor as Olivier. I'm probably still falling short, but I'm still trying. My point is, they must, those to whom you are asking us to speak, they must do what they want to do. I don't care what it is. If a black kid wants to be president of the United States, his odds are excruciating. But if he wants it, go after it. And the first thing he must do is set the political structure of America straight before it, that can be possible. Do you follow what I'm saying? It is America that, where, the, where the problem is. And uh, occasionally someone breaks through. But more than not, uh, I'm sure that the tens of thousands of people who aspire to be in the arts are never fulfilled as black people. They go on to something else. There was a time in Sydney's life, and uh, I know in my life, when it looked like we would not be able to pursue our interests uh, in the theater. And we, were st we had been students. And when we came out, there were just no parts. So we took up other professions. Uh, Sydney opened a restaurant. I had a restaurant. I was a short order cook. And it looked like that might be it for a while. <laughs> Roll up. 138, take three. <coughs> All right. Knight Riders hit Pappy Whitlock and his people here two weeks ago. Three days later, they burned out the wagon train supposed to meet me at Sulphur Flat. That's here. They got the Deef Smith County people at the waterhole this side of Claytown, here. They're heading this way. You're gonna have to move out tonight. We were figuring on four or five days. Them wagon tires got to be shrunk on the forge. Wagons don't roll, you double load. I want to be by the fork by midnight. Cut. Cut it. If there were equality of opportunity in this business, there'd be 15 Sidney Poitiers and 10 or 12 Belafontes, but there or is maybe not. the other way around. Watch it, watch it, watch it. <laughs> he's, and he's brilliant in the, uh, as a matter of fact, he is so good that I have a conflict. When I'm directing myself in a scene with him, I don't know where to keep the close-ups, you see. Because if I give him the close-ups, he's gonna wipe me out. You follow? That reminds me, you ain't got many coming this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> it's a ball. It's a thrill. What? Uh, the black people in the West were very much a part of the building of the West, of the exploration of the West, of the... Uh, of the, uh, the pain of the West. Uh, indeed. Now, the anguish of the West. Uh, this piece dealt with that. It dealt with black people looking for a new way a new life. It was very late in my life when I discovered black history, when I discovered black heroes, when I discovered uh, that there was such a thing as black beauty. Because all of my early childhood, uh, an oppressive society spent uh, most of its time convincing me that uh, I had no beauty, that there was no history, there was no background. Uh, and I didn't come to it uh, until I was in my teens. And it was when I came to it in my teens that I first began to dream because all my early life was just spent trying to find out who, I, who am I, what am I? I am not enamored of black history as such because black history is a part of human history. And human history is uh, dimensional. It has about it such degradation that we, like it or not, have to assume ownership for. That which is degrading in black history, that which is degrading in white history, that which is degrading in Indian, Spanish, Asian. Italian, Asian history, is all a part of the total history of man. You understand? I think, for instance, what we're doing in Vietnam and in Laos now and in Cambodia is obscene. You follow? And that's a part of black history, too, because some black boys are over there doing 
those dirty deeds. You dig? It's a part of white history because white boys are there doing those dirty deeds. It is also a part of Asian history because it is to the Asian this obscenity is being uh, uh, per perpetrated. But there are also Asians doing it to Asians. Aha. See. So it is the. I would love to uh, lend my support to that aspect of black history, which teaches us wonderful things about mankind. And I am similarly disposed, I, I hope, to those aspects in the other guy's culture or the other guy's history that contributes uh, in a like manner. I'm long-winded, ain't I? It's beautiful. I'm just glad that, uh, I'm just glad I discovered there was a thing called black history. Ditto. Mm -hmm. If the American dream is success, fortune, uh, superiority, and all of that, then I reject it. Uh, I reject it because it's, uh, it's anti-human. To pursue that as the only end in itself is, in fact, to pursue... It, it, it's a crime against humanity. Really uh, the whole thing about success and the American dream, it, the American dream is a myth, you know. Free enterprise is uh, not all that free. Um, very few people make it to the top. We did. The reasons are many why it happened. But for someone to look at us and get from it some impression of the American dream as such, I think they ought to look very close because what we seem to represent in terms of opportunities in the system is not quite so, you follow? Uh, there are too many combinations had to be put together for Belafonte to make it or for Poitiers to make it. Youngsters uh, coming along ought to know that the American dream is not quite a dream. It is more often a nightmare. American Dream by Jan Uretsky. People should live in peace with each other and people should be content with each other. People should make a good living and once they make a good living they should be content with it and not want more things. People should be equal and there should be no rich and no poor and people should not be racist and kids should not be thought small and stupid. And women should be equal but just equal, no more, no less. People should live in brotherhood and sisterhood too, and all togetherhood, the end. to know. Me wants to know. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Can I help? Nope. What's it gonna be? Stuff. Government stuff? No. Nope. Spaceship stuff? No. Nope. <coughs> Medicine? No. Nope. I give up. It's animal serum. What's animal serum? It's certain properties without which the universe and eternity regards for human beings. What you looking for? The applesauce. I know where it is. Where is it? Why should I tell you? You won't let me help. Come on, Matthew, tell me. Nope. You're a rat, Matthew. I know you are, but what am I? 
You're not going to play my drums anymore. I don't want to play your drums anymore. Damn it, Matthew. Did I help you carry that damn pool table all the way up to your room yesterday? So what? You're the one always using it. I can't even play pool. And you can forget about using my TV also. Then I'm not paying you the dollar I owe you. You're a rat. You weren't going to pay it anyway. Well, no, I'm really not going to pay it. If you give me the dollar, I'll let you help. I haven't got a dollar. What do you got? Two dimes. Give me the two dimes. You're crazy. I'm not going to give you all my money. One dime, then. Okay. What should I do now? Get the applesauce. Hey, Ma, is the new hiding place? Where is it? Find the applesauce. What'd you find there? Two chocolate grams. Give me one. Okay. What should I do now? Stir it. sit for 10 minutes. Come on, let's fight. It's done. Ugh, what do we do with the nut? Throw it out? No, now we gotta drink it. Drink it? What do we have to drink it for? It's an experiment. That's what you do with experiments. It smells like garbage. Medicine smells like garbage and it makes you healthy. I'm already healthy. This is a medicine. Then what is it? You'll see. Go on, take some. You're crazy. That stuff will kill you. How can it kill you? There's nothing but pure food in there. 
You do it first. I can't do it first. I have to watch the effects of the experiment. How much do you have to take? Just a little. Stick one finger in and lick it off. This enough? Plenty. What if I get sick? You can't get sick. There's bromo salts in there. Well, here it goes. What does it feel like? Well, it's not so bad once it goes down and you can taste the chocolate gram. Makes you feel like... What happened? You turned into a chicken. I thought you'd be a squirrel. Let me see what I look like. Get him here. I'm a pretty ugly chicken boy. Gotta get used to it. I don't want to get used to it. Why? What does it feel like? Skinny and I can't see good. What else does it feel like? I told you what it feels like. Now get me out of this chicken. First, tell me what it feels like. Get me out of here. Matthew, what are you afraid of? This is an important experiment. Wait till Mom sees what a mess I am. Boy, are you gonna get it. What a sissy. You're ruining the experience of a lifetime. I'm disgusted with you. Damn you, Adam! Change me back! Ma, Ma, look what Adam did to me! Ma! Ma! It's a good thing you fixed me, boy. You would have really gotten it from Ma if she'd come home and I was a chicken. Oh, what a queer. I hope I turn into an alligator. I'll bite your head off. What am I? You're a sheepdog. No, come on, what am I? You're a sheepdog. Crap. Can I have a ride? Where are you, crazy? You want to kill me? I just asked. What you changing back for? You're a nice dog. Shut up. Come on, let's go get some ice cream. Want to make some more of that stuff tomorrow? Not the same stuff. Want to make something else instead? Maybe. Adam Bob? Okay. But we have to get some more applesauce. The other night on television, someone was interviewing a former football player, Andy Robustelli. Andy said he thought there were more injuries in the game today because the men playing it weren't made of the same stuff they were when he played. That was about 10 years ago. It reminded me that just about that time, I heard President Eisenhower speaking in Abilene, Kansas, say that moral standards weren't as high among the youth as they were when he was planting sweet corn in his backyard there. For as far back as I can remember, people have been saying that the youth of the nation is getting soft and losing its moral fiber. I just doubt it. They certainly aren't wearing as much underwear, but I doubt if there's any less moral fiber. I'll bet the very day Andy Robustelli pulled on his first jockstrap, some old athlete was saying athletes weren't what they used to be. I'll bet the day little Ike Eisenhower was planting that sweet corn, someone was saying kids wouldn't work anymore. Last Thanksgiving, some clergyman in Chicago was complaining about sexual freedom among the young. He said he wondered what the pilgrims would think if they saw the dances the kids do today instead of the minuet. Frankly, I think the pilgrims would watch for a few minutes and then try to get with it. We're all evidence of the fact that the pilgrim fathers weren't always minuetting. For every pilgrim father, there was a pilgrim mother. The only people exempt from this odious comparison with their predecessors are the astronauts. No one says Alan Shepard and Ed Mitchell aren't what astronauts used to be because there didn't used to be any. You can bet, though, that in 10 years, someone is going to say the astronauts of 1981 aren't what the old-time astronauts used to be. I think the reason for all these disparaging remarks by the old about the young is obvious, too because of the intimations of death in the color of their hair, 
stoop of their shoulders or the sag of their chin. Older people are at a disadvantage with the young and they know it. Elders resent the suggestion implicit in young people's attitudes that they are young as a matter of their own choice, as if the old are old as the matter of their own choice. As a result, older people try to get even by saying kids aren't what they used to be when they were kids. All I can say is it's just amazing how long this country has been going to hell without ever having got there. What a thrill you are What a sight to see A thing that mortals really have no right to see Am I in the earth or in the sky? In loveliness am I when I look at you I forget myself I could go mad about you if I let myself should I let myself began to realize that what I was searching for actually was within myself. Actually, I was, uh, how shall I say this? I'm at a loss for words here. Um, I was the answer to all the things, say, I would pray to. I used to pray to God. I began to think that I'm God. In fact, I'm almost convinced that I am. <laughs> uh, I have a few words. No, no, Things seriously. No, no, seriously. I, I think, I think, I think this is, no, no, seriously. I think this is the whole damn trouble, you know. We're all searching out where we get on our knees, and every time we pray, we pray to something removed from us. Every time, every search we make is is a search for something always that is removed from ourselves. I gave up religion when I was Well, wait, it doesn't matter. You're always searching outward. You understand what I you mean? Know, God but I'm loves beginning you and he's going to burn you in hell. I'm beginning to suspect. You know? I'm beginning to suspect that it just takes us in a circle. Eventually we're going to be confronted with the fact that we are the very things we're searching for. You know what I mean? We ourselves are the answer. You know what's interesting yeah. is if my George, kid needs I, an I, image. I, no, if, no. My, if my kid has to look up on a wall and see a crucifix, see a guy like this with nails in him. 
And to identify with that, no. I think the crucifix with Christ on it dying, that is barbaric. Barbaric. What if bar my kid has to identify with anything, I want him to look up in the wall and see a picture of man on the moon. You know what I mean? Well, actually, wow. here you have here. Mike. Here you have. Man it's merely moon. a yes. Yes. Listen, yes. Mike. man no, doing no, something, wait, not just no. suffering wait, eternally. No, wait. Know? Here's something. This is merely a reminder. You know what the crucifix is? It's a guilt complex uh, that's been back it's been for. Made into that. What? Yeah, made well, it to that, sure. It that's is. not Wait. what it is. In, in, in if you in if fact. you look if you look at Catholicism, you'll find Saint Paul spread the word. Christ didn't spread it. Saint Paul. Saint Paul was the Lenin of uh, Catholicism. Well, so yeah, that's true. Point? But if you go back and read the words of Christ, you'll find. My it. point is that look at when you're a kid. A lot of times they tell you that every time you do something wrong, you pound another nail into Christ. You know. Yeah, but that's you realize that what, what that can do to a kid psychic? I, agree. I say that all that all through his Wait. life, every time he does something wrong, he puts a nail into somebody. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Wrong. That is ridiculous. Wait, yeah, first, 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 that is a tremendous guilt complex that you're giving a kid. He, he a kid is born, he doesn't know who Christ was. Do you know if I was back in those times, and Christ was going by me with the cross, I'd take the cross off his back and I'd call him a damn fool. A fool. And you missed the whole point. The, when they tell me uh, Christ died for your sins, I didn't ask him to. If oh, yeah. it was his thing to be crucified, hey, let Mike, him go ahead. Mike, Jim but says he didn't you. die for me. Back he didn't die for me. Mike, Mike, Jim says you missed the point. Yeah, well, I think you something. missed the whole point. What's that, Jim? The whole point of, of what Christ was saying. I think, I, I agree with you about the organized religion bit. I think they've distorted the words of Christ. All Christ was saying was two things. Yeah, but the simple love your part, neighbor and love God. That's all he said. You lost me. We're talking about uh, Jesus. We're talking about the Catholic Church, which is my religion, so don't wrap it. I don't like it. No, 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 no. Uh, no don't give me that. No, no. Way. You always say something, and then you backtrack I'm with a, a few sentences and try to get out of it. Uh, I don't like what you said. Do you believe in God? Mm, you reluctantly. Re oh, reluctantly. Oh, yeah. I hope reluctantly he believes in you, too. What's your God? Maybe he doesn't. I God couldn't care less. Like Oh my your God, God, my God's a good God. Well, who is your God? He takes care of me. Well, go ahead, tell me about your He's God. He's good to me. My God, I got faith in my God. He's, he's mine. He's yours, too, if you want no, him. No, I want to hear about your God. Mine? Is he very personal? He's very personal. We talk to each other. Yeah? I talk, he listens. Yeah? Because he's wise. He's wise and he's good. And maybe I don't understand everything that's happening to me. And uh, being human... I get a little angry that these things have been, uh, not so much now, but before, a lot of awful things happened. Uh, it was rough going, uh, raising the kids by myself, uh, the money situation and all, and I used to sit and cry. But uh, everything came out great. Everything worked out swell, and uh, I don't have myself to thank for it. Possibly in a little way, I've got, you know, I can... Uh, I can say I did a pretty good job, but I did I did a pretty good job with his help okay, yeah, all yeah. the way. I won't say oh, my God's I pretty good though, Mike. I, I don't know about yours. And I won't ask you a question about you and Two your God. Yeah. Hey, you know, yeah. hey, hey, Mike. Listen. Mine's a great guy, listen. and he died on the cross. No, hey, wait, wait a minute. It's your belief. It's you did mind. something tremendous once. I remember in that neighborhood, and you spoke out against the hoods around that neighborhood, and you said it's God who did it. And I said, what about Ann Guerrero? Do you oh, give hey. yourself any credit? I says, no, not really. I'm only a tool. I'm only a... Uh, God works through us is what I believe. Uh, that sounds square and corny. I don't care. I don't care. Let it sound square and corny. And you can uh, come out with all your authors that you've read and which you're very good at spouting off these names. That don't mean to me. <laughs> I believe. Hey. Okay, you both believe, you know, the same thing essentially. I don't think there's any difference between God being out there and God being in here. Yeah, well, God see, is in here. You, let, let if me, you believe, let me He's in here. Point. Let me interject this point. I think, see, see, see well, I, I don't know how, how you do in your everyday life, but I go to some big affairs. I meet some of the big wigs, some of the little people. I deal mostly with little people, but I'm a person that believes in something like it is. You understand what I'm trying to say? I don't think it's even necessary to discuss. I was raised in church. We, I went to church seven days a week. No kidding, for years. Me too. Now, I don't condemn a person if they want to be a Catholic, whatever you want to be. But however, I, I know this. You got to eat down here. You got to sleep. You want a peace of mind. You want security. 
And you don't want to be living in fear. When you talk about fear, I was, I, I like that, I like that Leanne, if you bring, if you bring your union up. No, no. In the same no. relationship no, no. with God. No, no, no. I give up, I'm walking away Well, that's his God. That, hey, Ann, no. and his union is your God. It's not mine, it's no. his. No, you I, God. No, you cut me off. No, I wasn't between my God and his God. No, no, no. no. Let, you're mad at everybody. I didn't finish. I didn't finish. You're going to miss my point. I want to be a realistic. I hope so. I don't want, I don't want to get into no cat and dog fight with you about your God. He said he, he don't know whether he believes in God or not. Yeah, isn't that You said shame? that uh, both of you, uh, I know more about this than you do. I'm not concerned. Now, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm not even concerned about that. I live down here on this earth. I want a home, I want security, I don't want to live in fear that somebody's going to drop an atomic bomb down on me, and, and if I get sick tomorrow, I want to be taken care of. Leon? Yeah, but you can't get that. Though. Leon? That's what it amounts to. Why? Well, because that's, life well, just doesn't that. amount to that. Leon, though, it, life doesn't um, amount to that. You believe in God? I was raised in church. Well, I don't debate that with anybody. He was raised in church, yeah. too. If, 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 look, if, if, Do you <laughs> believe in God? That's what I I'm believe, asking. okay, you want to know about I yeah. believe in how I've been. I, I'm not well, going to debate whether it's, 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 uh, uh, if it's a society. I believe in God, but I just don't know who he is. That's just, <laughs> I know. I'll take, I'll take the, let, let, let me tell you something. I've got the dice. Okay, now. Well, insofar as religion is concerned, you understand it has served. Many times it's served adversely. Other times it's served mankind well, regardless of what faith it was. You understand? But let's face it, as we define... God and so on, religions actually have been a crutch. They have been a third foot for man. There's no question about it. And especially, I'm going to say, especially in this country I'm going to speak, especially the black man, it has definitely been a third foot. You understand? And he, the, the, uh, the black man more than anyone else in this country, I, was, I would go so far as to say, has when he could find no answers anywhere else, he went to his church or he was told to pray. He was told to sing to the heavens, you understand, which was uh, a tragedy, you understand. Had he, been, had, had he not been told this, taught these things, he would have learned to stand far sooner on his own feet. He would have discarded this crutch entirely. Wait, uh, just a moment, Leon. The only point that I'm saying is, I believe in a higher being. But I got common sense. I got common sense. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. And, and, and I, I don't like to discuss people's yeah, religion. God helps those who help themselves. That's yeah, but okay, God. but look, I was a superintendent of Sunday school, 12 years old. And I told you, I went to church every day. I went to all fumes. I was an executive at, of the church. I went out and got flowers. And I got the Sunday school cards. I didn't see no black people on there. I saw all white angels. God was white. Everything was white. I raised the question. At 12 years old, and I was brought down, you see. So I said this, I didn't believe everything that I was being taught. But after I got out of the world where I am today, that's the thing I think we're getting away from. I think we can talk about Hitler, talk about Khrushchev and Khrushchev, everybody. I'm only concerned about, I live here in Chicago, the United States. My son has fought for this country. I was available, but I was exempted from the war. The only thing I'm trying to say to us today, let's not live in fear. I don't mean fear of uh, violence so much. Fear of insecurity. Uh, your rent is going to be paid if you get sick. Mine got uh, these, are, these are the things. <laughs> these are the things I want to talk about. Now, you, I don't want to go all the way around. Right, the country. Leon, just uh, a minute. God is you will a white never man, ever live a black life man, life and now. God That's is a yellow man. man. In Wait other minute. words, <laughs> uh, we're going to come back to what I said before. In the totality, uh, totality of things, you are... You are God yourself. Believe me, you're an integral part of God himself. Without you, God himself would be incomplete. Did you ever, did you ever think of that? This is the yes-no press conference. The point of the game is that one person from the group will be interviewed, and he can't say yes, and he can't say no. A little bell will ring if any of you says yes or if any of you says no. Sarah, by the way, is God, and we're very pleased to have you with us. It's quite a surprise to notice that you're a woman. Was it very hard to uh, make the earth? Sometimes 
Do you feel that you've uh, made a mistake creating the human race? Are you happy with your work? I am. You are? Are you happy in polluting the skies? I'm not doing that. Yes, you are, because you created man. But man created pollution. That, that's quite true. We understand that you're on a special trip here to see who's uh, <coughs> causing all the trouble. Have you found anybody? Not yet. Do you have a husband? I don't. How do you feel living singly? I feel perfectly fine about it. You do? Does, does, um, are you, do, are you disappointed in man, some of the things that man has done? I am very. What are some of those things that you're disappointed? Pollution. What else? Littering. Well, that's pollution. There's pollution. What else? Well, mostly pollution. Yeah, but that really bothers yes. you the most. Why is it that you yes. fa feel that it will be the end of your world? Yes. Right. I don't think Go ahead, answer. that um, they should do that. I created the world not to be polluted. And they just come along. I created them, but I didn't think they would create didn't pollution. You, didn't you realize that they would pollute? I mean, you should realize I that. I didn't. Do you feel badly that, that some of the animals you created are extinct and that we've uh, upset the natural balance of nature by importing animals? And I feel terrible about that. You do? Do you I have do. any special plan, and anything that you think will remedy this whole thing? I can't think of anything especially. You've run out of ideas? I have. Did you have any at all in the last say, million well, years? Well, I really can't do anything now. I, When I made man, I put man in charge. When you created dinosaurs, did you mean for them to get extinct and then man would become? I wasn't really sure what would happen. You just created them. I created and I let them do what have they would. Have you created any other world? Not that I can think of. Oh. Um, are you disappointed in war? Very. Why? I mean, what do you have against it? I have almost everything against it. I don't think they should be fighting. I made this world for everyone, isn't there not any for way to, one country. Isn't there any way to stop the fighting? Well, I can't really go in into everybody. But everybody said, but, um, you're everywhere. God is everywhere, even if he's a girl. <laughs> well, we understand that you once pushed the Red Sea back and it separated. Couldn't you uh, sort of hold the fire? I couldn't. Why couldn't I you? tried. I, I just couldn't. Why couldn't you? It was too hard for me. It was too much pressure. Uh, I know why you couldn't do that, because Moses held back the sea. Uh, do you feel more powerful with churches backing you up and uh, people praying to you? I do. You do? If more people pray to you, do you think you could stop war and that sort of thing? Well, I might be able to if I get enough people to, but I don't think there will really ever be enough people. Why you do don't. Why do you barely ever show yourself a personal appearance? I mean, why don't you show more often? Like, this is the first time I've ever seen you. Yeah, me too. That's because most people, some people don't believe in me. And if I came down, they would think, you know, oh, that's a figment right. of your imagination. Why did you this. decide to come down now and show yourself to us? Well, we'll, we'll put it in a, uh, in a newspaper. Well, yes, we're the press. Well, it's been great talking to you. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mr. Come on, thank Mr. you very much, and we hope you come again very soon. Yes. The American Dream by Remus Sirota. Oh, how marvelous it would be to live in New York and still own a tree. Oh, wouldn't it be great if peace settled on the earth and a whole new world was brought to birth? A world filled with love and beauty and wonder, too. But this can only happen by the hands of me and you. All these things I've said are part of a wonderful scheme. I hope we'll someday get the great American dream, the end. What a thrill you are. What a sight to see. A thing that mortals really have no right to see. Am 
I in the earth or in the sky, lost in loveliness, am I? When I look at you, I forget my I could go mad about you if I let myself Should I let myself off, pass you by Lost in loveliness Am I? I know What's more, I know how dangerous you are. If I were wise, I'd close my eyes and walk away and worship from afar. Through the Lord. I could go mad about you if you would want me to. What's the point of owning an air conditioner if you have to turn it off every time it gets hot? Huh? Now, let's play the creative play food challenge. We'll describe four creative play foods and withhold the price. You guess which one costs the most per pound. 